Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking into our latest TDR Trade Black podcast. I'm your host, Shad Dales. Lots going on both overseas and internationally in places like Germany and the UK, as well as south of the border in the US. But we want to have a panel discussion here today with some of the biggest minds in the Canadian landscape. Look, we all know that the cannabis industry started in Canada. There's been a lot of consolidation over the last five to seven years, but we really want to understand where this market is today and the companies that are still around what are the opportunities that present itself? So with that, let's welcome in our panelists. First, let's welcome in the CEO of Next Sleeve Solutions, which trades on the CSC and of the ticker symbol OILS, Emma Andrews. Good to see you again. How are things? Hey, really well, Shad. Thanks for having us again. Yeah, I appreciate it. Let's also welcome in the CEO of MTL Cannabis, Michael Perrin. Good to see you, Michael. First time hey. on the podcast. Good to have you on. No, thanks a lot, Shad. I appreciate you being here. Yes, appreciate it. And also, uh, Chief Communications Officer of High Tie, which trades in the NASDAQ under the ticker symbol HITI Omar Khan. Good to see you. How are things? Awesome. Great to be here. Great. Appreciate it. And uh, interesting times in this cannabis space. So many things that are going on, both in Canada, the US, and Europe. Emma, I'll begin with you. It all started, like I said, off the top in Canada. How would you best describe the Canadian cannabis landscape right now and the biggest opportunities? It presents within this market moving forward heading into 2025 ever evolving i think my yeah. colleagues here can echo every quarter i feel like we're reassessing strategy and in other cpg verticals you'd have a roadmap for 12 to 18 months if not more ahead of you so the fact that we're constantly having to be hyper vigilant about the competitive landscape and shifting consumer preferences but also with a mind to the future for potential regulatory changes so positioning yourself well for what might open up in the future I, I honestly say you have to have your finger on the pulse in this industry. You cannot be behind closed doors. You better be on the front lines, either consuming the product, engaging with it at retail or immersed in, in the ecosystem from B2B or CPG perspectives. Like you really have to know, have your finger on the pulse. Yeah. Consumer preferences are shifting as innovation shifts. Yeah. Michael, you want to add to that maybe some examples as to how you have to change in such a rapid time? Because, you know, this industry, just when you think it's moving quickly, it gets even quicker over time from year to year, don't you think? For sure. And, and, and what we've seen in Canada, too, and just to echo uh, Emma's statement on, on just evolving, it's it's we're really seeing a transition from the early stages of our industry in Canada, where it was very, you know, the promoter came out, it's, it's building it, building a business, trying to be as big as you can. And you know, very few flare, few players at the very beginning, and now you're seeing it evolve. Not unlike any other emerging on industry, like a dot com or, or what have you, in the past to promoter to operator. And so a lot of uh, a lot of the folks, like you mentioned at the very beginning, who are still in this industry have evolved. Yeah. They're they're very operationally focused and and you know, like Emma mentioned, com competitive and and performing. And that's the one thing that's really driving uh, driving the Canadian market to continue to grow because it is it is growing in a straight line. It is still growing in the double digits. Uh, on an annual basis and and not only domestically but we're seeing exports uh increase yeah. dramatically as well in canada there's it being a global trade partner to to the world and it's it's really showing out in canada and canadian cannabis yeah we're seeing a lot of we have seen a lot of consolidation in this market but let's face it the three companies that i'm basically speaking here today you omar michael and emma you guys have like basically i don't want to say survive but you know at the same time there's been a lot of change but there is opportunities presented, obviously, for cannabis companies that are still around today. So saying that, like, what would you say are key lessons that, you know, Canadian cannabis companies that are still here today have learned, I guess, during this whole phase over these last five to seven years? Is that to me? That's to you, Omar. Sorry. Yeah, look, I, I would say uh, you got to focus on operational execution, right? Early on, we saw a lot of hype. Uh, we saw a lot of people uh, really, you know, focused on you know, I'm not going to name names, but buying greenhouses in exotic <laughs> international locations. That gave uh, it away. <laughs> right? you, know, you know, it is it is what it is. I think Ben Kaplan, a friend of mine, has a, has a book coming out uh, shortly called Catch a Fire, which kind of outlines some of yeah. this, this history. Um, so I'll let folks read that. But look, you know, one of the things we really pride ourselves at High Tide is our, is our focus on operational execution. Uh, we're, we're not a company that tends to lead the hype. Uh, but we are a company that prides ourselves on uh, ourselves on under promising and over delivering. And if you do see us make a commitment, uh, you know, we, we deliver on that and we deliver on it usually uh, ahead of schedule. Uh, so, look, you know, we're at 186 stores now, as you know, across Canada, across yep. five Canadian provinces. Uh, I think we were at about 25 uh, new organic store openings year to date. 
I think we had told the market uh, that it would be in the range of 20 to 30 this year. So with uh, about six weeks to go, we're already you know, in that range and look forward to announcing more soon. Uh, but like I said, it's all about the operational execution. It's also about being disruptive, right? We saw, uh, you know, we, yeah, I think the market uh, and, the pub and the public saw uh, a few years ago, we came out with our, you know, I think it was a first of its kind uh, membership discount model in cannabis. Uh, and yeah. that has had a disruptive effect uh, in the market. Uh, and one that I think uh, one that I think is positive for both for consumer choice, uh, but also for, uh, you know, uh, access to legal cannabis at a, at a reasonable price across the country. Yeah. Well, you talked about price and both price and operational efficiencies is going to be key when it comes to product differentiation. So, Michael, what would you say is like, you know, I guess in product development, are you seeing when it comes to consumer trends? Like what are the biggest trends that we're noticing more and more here in 2024? heading into 2025 from what you're seeing here in Canada? Honestly, and, and this goes across all the product verticals, is it's a focus on quality. And, and that's, that's the one thing that I've th really seen over the last five years of this industry, five, six years now, is it's the consumers figuring out what good quality product is. And it's not just, you know, the, the Field of Dreams model, build it and they will come and it doesn't, you know, quality doesn't matter. And that's, you know, it's something that I think all three of our companies and our respective verticals have really focused on is that quality experience for the consumer. And, and that's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll steal one of the words that uh, Omar uses focus. And that's one area where, you know, all three of us are uh, very different businesses and different business models, but it's uh, we're all laser focused. And, you know, at MTL, we're never going to develop a retail business where, you know, we don't we're not going to do oil extraction. That's what Emma and Omar do amazingly well and their teams do amazingly well. And that's where you're able to really see, you know, a people who focus on quality are starting to really win in the market um, because consumers are smart. They they know what good quality product. Yeah. They're always going to gravitate towards really good quality product on the shelves. And you're starting to see an evolution of really complementary business and, you know, folks working together as opposed to trying to, like Omar mentioned, trying to, you know, boil the ocean and try to do every single thing within the Canada that you potentially could do in the cannabis world. And you're seeing a lot of really interesting partnerships that are that are forming between businesses who are really trying to promote and cross promote and help each other grow. So it's is that where yeah. yeah, go ahead, Emma, go finish. You're I was going to echoing I was that as well partnerships, right? Yeah. yeah. How would you best, uh, best describe, I guess, collaboration amongst companies can, operating can in Can I give an example? Yeah, go ahead. We, we, have a, we have a medical platform and in, you know, yes, we have our recreational brand that's on the shelves across Canada, but we also have a medical platform that serves uh, a, a really big part of our, our, our industry, which is the medical community, specifically the veteran focused medical community. And when I think about partnerships, like for us, yes, we have our products on the menu, but we also have some amazing suppliers and, you know, Emma and her company and, and Nextleaf, like they're amazing partners, and amazing suppliers for us. And this is where you're able to really, you know, the folks who have been in this industry for a while and kind of know who's a strong performer, you get to work together and you get to work together. You get to build our businesses together. And it's, 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 it's a really cool thing that you're seeing really evolve in our industry. Yeah. Well, Emma, you want to add to that? Oh, just the shift away from vertical integration. And I think, you know, we've hit on that in the, the earlier days of the industry. It was about, you know, how many square foot can you amass? Like, what is the metrics that you can show for volume or um, footprint in the market? And now, to Michael's point, like, we're really starting to niche down and find the right collaborative partners because, you know, time has told who are the stable operators to Omar's part point. So yeah. finding those stable operators, finding who can complement what your niche is, is a hundred percent the way forward versus trying to do it all. And that was the land race of the early days. And I think investors can have a lot of confidence in getting behind a company that knows what their focus is, knows what their value proposition is, sees the path ahead and understands the competitive landscape and how they're going to make their mark. So yeah, the partnerships, commercial partnerships are huge to us as well. And, you know, gratefully our products are in Omar's stores and gratefully I purchase Michael's all the time and we're, you know, colleagues, um, as far as being CEOs in this industry and pushing forward and making a sustainable legacy. So partnerships are everything, relationships, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's the biggest challenge I found. Like the feedback in the early days, there was so much competition amongst each other when it came to a lot of the cannabis companies. But you guys would all best describe that the collaboration has definitely changed a corner and you're seeing more and more companies work in conjunction with each other because I know you're giving obviously a great you know, uh, example right here, but you're seeing more and more of that, I assume, Emma? 
Yeah, and I appreciate, to be honest, it's interesting how um, publicly traded cannabis is. I come from the natural products industry and a lot of yeah. them are privately held companies. And so the posturing and understanding the dynamic and how different companies are performing wasn't as transparent. And I actually really appreciate that in cannabis because it allows you to look behind closed doors at a vantage point that lets you assess who you want to build those relationships with, whether they're credible operators, whether they have a stable financial future. And I think this is the point and poignancy of where we're at in the market is you mentioned the consolidation. We see other, you know, operators filing for CCAA. And while that is a bit humbling, it also helps weed out the noise so you can focus on who is really willing to and able to deliver results in market. I remember well, I, I, saw, I did see a stat a while ago that showed that like in 1898, there was something like over 150 car companies in the U.S. Wow. Uh, and, and now there's a, like four, right? Um, by, the, so, by the mid 20th century, yeah, there was right? three or four. That was, yeah, no, there might be a little bit more now with Tesla <laughs> and, and whatnot. But the point is, you know, consolidation is a normal part of a, uh, of a is a is a normal part on the, of, of a journey of a maturing journey for an industry, uh, particularly a nascent industry like can, like cannabis. I do think we need to be cognizant that um, you know there are still a lot of folks out there who are hurting. Uh, I think about a quarter of CCAA filing still this year. Uh, yeah. related to cannabis. I yeah. know in particular that there are a lot of smaller operators on the retail side that are hurting. Um, and that's why, you know, we are collaborating with organizations like the Independent Retail Cannabis Collective, uh, C3 and others to really push for broad based regulatory and legislative reform, common sense, we call it uh, regulatory and legislative reform at provincial and federal level to help to help the industry succeed. Right. Not everyone can be like high tide and generate positive net income. Uh, albeit, you know, modest. Um, but we need to get folks to, we need to get this industry to a position where it's uh, sustainable over the long run. And that's some of the, that's one of the things that we were, we're we, we take pride at High Tide in having taken a bit of a leadership, uh, leadership position on. So that's a question maybe for all three of you. Do you foresee any changes? You know, when we talk about how the industry's changed, there's price compression, uh, excise tax has still stayed the same. So based on conversations, look, you're all leaders of, you know, some big companies in the cannabis space in Canada. What's some of the dialogue that you've, uh, uh, I guess, received from the government? And like I said, off the top, do you foresee any changes, Omar? Yeah, I'll jump in. So on the federal level, obviously, the big the big focus for the producers is is essentially twofold. It's it's um, it's it's uh, moving to an ad valorem uh, excise tax rate uh, and moving towards a national excise tax stamp. Um, and I think, to be fair, I think C3 has been making some progress on both of those fronts. Are we going to see an ad valorem 10% rate in the next federal budget? Probably not. Uh, and that's because of the logistics around such a change are, would be, are, are very challenging, right? They need to essentially get every province and territory on side. They need to revise the memorandum of understanding that they signed between the federal government, the provinces and the territories um, in 2018. That's going to take some time. I wouldn't be surprised if the federal government came out uh, with a token um, reduction in the rate, at least to the federal portion of the rate, uh, to use that as a bit of leverage with the provinces to get. How them. soon? How soon do you think? Uh, if, if they did it, it would have to be in the budget, right? And the budget's usually in the spring. Yeah. Um, and I think the, 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 if they did that, the rationale would be to use that as leverage to push the provinces to move further, either on, on, on agreeing to reductions on their portion of the rate uh, or on reductions to their uh, wholesale markups that they're that they're charging. Interesting. Yeah. And then there's a there, you know there's a lot of stuff happening at the provincial level, but uh, I'll let uh, I'll let others weigh in on what I just said about the feds, and then we can move to the provinces if you want. Yeah, Michael, do you want to add to that? And if that's the case, like how do you do you see a lot of consolidation still taking place uh, here in Canada? I, I, and really, it comes down to how each company operates to be honest with you. And, and I always say like when it comes or like our view of, of, of changing reg regulations, like they're, they're amazing. I would love for like Omar said, like a, a national excise stamp as opposed to provincial, obviously the rates being reduced, like that would, that would benefit everybody in the industry. But yeah, as leaders of our companies, it's, we have to play the cards we're dealt and it always goes back to running a sustainable, resilient business. And as much as I would love, you know, those regulations and a magic wand to you know, wave and that change tomorrow, 
Um, until we see it in the budget, we have to continue on operating as with the cards we're dealt in front of us. And that's, like I said, building those sustainable, profitable businesses and, and working, like I said, working in collaboration with all the people along the supply chain. Like Amar said, like there's a lot of folks hurting out there and making sure that, you know, as a, you know, I'll speak on the producer side of things that making sure that it's always rooted in a good quality product that a retailer can pick up and is not going to be worried about, or is, it, is this going to move or not? Do I have to discount it 50, 60% just to get it off my, off my inventory? And that's where, you know, companies have, can build a brand and build trust with the retailer, the distributor and the consumer across the board. So you can sustain through some of these challenges like, like high excise. That's Are a very working? good point. You know, I, I've heard in the past, some cannabis industry leaders, uh, you know, really complain and blame government for the fact that their that their businesses aren't succeeding. Everybody knew the le le legislative and regulatory framework when they decided to enter this this market, right? So you have to you have to build your business around what exists now. Good point. You can, you can work. You can build coalitions to advocate for positive change moving forward, but hope is not a strategy, right? Yes. Um, so you know, I I, I feel for those uh, who are like I said, I feel for those who are struggling. Uh, but simply blaming uh, governments and regulators for all of your woes is, is a bit of a cop out, uh, in, in my opinion. That Emma, can't we, be your Mary. <laughs> yeah. Emma, to Omar's point, like we have seen a lot of companies built on hope. Why do you think that was from day one? Is just people not doing their homework? Like, why are we in this situation for many in this space as to what's really happened? I think over speculation, and I can say that with candor, I've been involved in some companies in the past that have not succeeded. And I definitely have learned from that. And I think it was the over promise and under deliver, which is ironic because Omar was mentioning that's the exact opposite of how, how the path forward is right now. But that was the early days when it was so speculative. Michael yeah. brought this up as well, right? It's stable now versus speculative. And when it was speculative, even as an example, we over anticipated maybe what the consumption rates would be for edibles or beverages, as an example. But with the um, potency limits on them, that category has just not succeeded in the way that we might have expected. So depending on how a company positioned itself in the early days, that may or may, or may not have panned out for them. You know, I can say um, humbly at NextLeaf, we've been very agile to pivot where the opportunity is. So we launched with vapes. Ultimately, now soft gels are our MVP. That is the product that makes us the most revenue. And that is not what we thought would be our breadwinner in day one. So you have to maintain an agile mindset. You have to fish where the fish are, if you will, and be conservative in your estimations, because if you blow it out of the water, awesome. But you have to make sure that you're meeting, you know, your bottom line with the basics of what you're, you're able to generate in market and be really bootstrapped. I think that resourcefulness from the early days should not disappear you know even though we're six years into this industry you still have to have kind of a startup mentality where every dollar counts we have a bit of a funny hashtag internally like every dollar diligence with every dollar is our uh, internal yeah. hashtag it's just yeah like yeah. The, the roi is measured to the dollar and that like i said to, to that point i think we're one of the few <laughs> companies uh, at least publicly traded companies in canadian cannabis that that is generating that income and we do not fly business class uh, we're all still a back of the plane economy yeah yeah. Well, I think I hear that more so than often now is just that you got to focus on your core strengths. And some might say, well, thanks, Captain Obvious. But the reality is, is that <laughs> it's a new industry. You need data. But that's where I hear everywhere, where it's Canada, internationally, in the U.S. It's like I was at an event a week and a half ago in Michigan, and they're saying the average dispensary has 500 SKUs in a uh, dispensary store in Michigan. And good luck trying to get a bud tender to have us head wrapped around 500 different SKUs. Like you can understand. So they're talking about downsizing and really looking at the data as to what's selling and like what's working. So look, we've seen them like a lot of Canadian markets, they've downsized their production facilities and are, I guess, pivoting towards the international medical market. I'll get into that in just a moment. But what ideas, I guess, have you discussed about the oversupply of cannabis in the Canadian market that we, I guess could be more viable? Like, are we looking at something that there could be a solution that's right underneath our nose that we may not be uh, seeing right now. Well, it depends uh, if you're quantifying oversupply as biomass and cultivation. The beauty of our operation is we can turn that into extracts that are more shelf stable, obviously in higher value. So yep. the oversupply does not intimidate me in that regard. I would also question the oversupply of brands in the market. So to your point about those 500 SKUs, I'd be curious how many brands those represent because our philosophy is to get the butt tenders and retailers bought into one value proposition. So all of our innovation is coming under one brand portfolio, which is Glacial Gold. And so 
in this regard, we're putting, this is the diligence with dollars, we're putting all our eggs into one basket and trying to create a value proposition that spans categories rather than come up with new brands every single time, which creates overwhelm for the bud tender and overwhelm for the consumer. So the more they can identify with single producers as their one source of trust or, or yeah. value, the more they'll have that opportunity to, to find the right ca cannabis consumption that's right for them. And so, yeah, the oversupply could be on the ingredient and biomass side, but it also could be on the brand landscape side as well. And also, oh. you know, just to add to that, I would say that our, our inability right now to do any meaningful type of uh, joint product promotions in stores with LPs uh, is really hurting both sides. Uh, so if you're looking at it strictly from the perspective of illicit market conversion, yeah, uh, we know that the ability. So right now we know that mo that the majority of purchasing decisions in our stores are being done based on THC uh, content and price. Uh, both of those two metrics are important metrics, but not necessarily. You know, it's it's not all one should be looking at when making a purchasing decision related to cannabis. Uh, so one of the things that we are as part of a broader coalition, including uh, the Independent Retail Cannabis uh, Collective, uh, are talking to governments, provincial governments about is, is perhaps following a bit of the Saskatchewan model, uh, where retailers and LPs are allowed to partner on some of these in-store promotions uh, to be able to educate consumers uh, and to be able to build some brand identity, right? Which because is badly needed. Another thing we know that that's, that's another key driver in terms of um, illicit market conversion, particularly with some of those hardcore legacy consumers out there. Well, look, this was legalized federally, but I don't think there was much of an action plan from the governments as to how to think this through as far as what happened afterwards. But there's tons of conversations that we could have about the illicit market, what you're putting into your bodies. And like there's been stats that show much as 80 percent of consumers in the U.S., cannabis consumers want to support the legal market. Saying that, Omar, how would you best describe the legal market versus the illicit market today versus, say, five years ago in Canada? Look, so, uh, you know, um, in government relations, everything is about incremental wins, right? So I think yeah. incrementally over over the last five or six years, we have seen a gradual decline in overall illicit market sales across Canada. I would say up until recently, um, you know, again, this is anecdotal, but I'm sure it'll be borne out in stats whenever we see the next stats, National Stats Can survey come out. Uh, but we are seeing an uptick, particularly in Ontario, in terms of illicit sales, both uh, from a resurgence in brick and mortar dispensaries. Yeah. Um, and also more concerningly, um, uh, illegal online websites. So we were actually happy to see the government of Ontario uh, come out yesterday. Uh, with proposed legislation that would make um, the, the illegal, the promotion or advertising of illegal cannabis uh, a provincial offense punishable by up to $250,000 fine. Wow. We were also happy to see uh, in their last budget, they came out with $31 million over three years um, for their joint provincial task force, uh, for their joint po provincial police task force uh, to specifically target illegal online websites. So, you know, more needs to be done, but definitely positive steps in that regard. But yeah, I, I think we have seen a gradual decline. Part of it is because the quality of legal cannabis has improved. Part of it is because access to legal cannabis has improved. And thirdly, I would say, and, you know, we've played a part in this, uh, the price point uh, of illegal can or sorry, the price point of legal cannabis versus illegal cannabis. Uh, that that price differential has narrowed, although it's still about 25 percent. If you if you look at the last De Deloitte report. Hmm. You know, when I look at this, because um, I used to work at Legacy Media in Toronto and uh, marketing and branding, lots of opportunities in the space, but uh, our legal team and the government doesn't really allow a lot of that stuff. Michael, when we look at the future of cannabis, many believe actually the future is in edibles, vapes, beverages, that sort of thing, beauty products, CPG industry. The government here in Canada is still viewing this very much as the same as, say, tobacco. Do you see that ever changing? I mean... I look at our numbers here and we're six years into this industry and still, you know, and Emma pointed out perfectly at the very beginning, everyone was, you know, frankly, just calling their shot of, you know, I remember that one company was saying drinks are going to be 30% of the industry, XYZ products are going to be 30% of the industry or what have you. But at the end of the day, so 70 cents of every dollar is still spent on flower based products and other flower pre-rolls. Yeah. And that's something where I look at like, you know, this has been an industry where people have been making a lot of money and generating a lot of business for the better part of the last 80 years. And most of it has been through plant-based cannabis. And so until the market really says otherwise, um, that's, that's where, that's where the cannabis market is right now. And you're seeing it very similar in the U S like a little bit 
tweaks here and there, but for the most part, it's pretty evenly distributed. And when I think about the future, I just think of, you know, what's, what's been going on in the last seven years and it's going to continue on until those new novel products really come out and take hold and get into the lexicon of, you know, of, of the general consumer. And that takes time. Like building, building new consumers is a lot harder than transferring consumers who have been consuming and have had disposable income allocated to cannabis. No different than what we all have for, you know, disposable income for our, I don't know, your, your chips and your six pack of beer on a Friday evening. Yeah. And that, that disposable income has always been allocated toward those cannabis products. So it's much easier for those consumers and, you know, noting like Omar said is like that conversion rate. And that's converting from the legacy market to the to the new market to the to the you know current legal market, and it really is driven by quality product that is at an accessible price where a consumer says, "Hey, I got value out of that part of purchase." Yeah, don't want to think consumer trends have changed. Ask somebody thirty and under. I'm sure it'll be a lot different than what we were used to growing up. I'm 48 now, and it's just like when I see kids in their early 20s, it's like alcohol is just not a cool thing anymore, and it's just it's changing yeah. rapidly, right? But, you know, Emma, to Michael's point, like you don't want to build a business on hope as to what Omar alluded to earlier. Like, do you think we will see some sort of marketing opportunities? Maybe it's not around the stigma of like the flower and smoke portion of it. When we see all these other products that are coming online, do you think it becomes more and more of uh, a marketing lifestyle, knowing it's going to be part of consumers lifestyles as this uh, industry continues to grow and emerge? Yeah. And Michael started the, the 70% of flour, which I, you know, I don't deny I love flour too. And I believe that that predominance is because there is such stifling um, ability to innovate because of excise tax. So when excise tax relief or reform hopefully comes even to some degree that allows brands to then reinvest in either the technology for the hardware, as an example, for vape devices or innovation within edibles, as an example, like molds to create a custom edible is incredibly expensive. So it's prohibitive to actually innovate something that differentiates you from the illicit channel. So I believe that there will be more interest and growth within the 2.0 categories, the extracts, ingestible extracts, vapes, soft gels, all of those products Agreed. when innovation is more tangible. So a lot of the products we're innovating are, you know, the 510 carts that have been in the illicit market for decades. And so you know, the, the price and the quality has to be there for sure, but also innovation has to push the categories forward to attract the consumer in, not only from the legacy market, but also from other verticals. Like my grandma, my mom, like CBN is a beautiful cannabinoid for them. And so to attract them into the industry isn't about stealing them away from illicit, right? This is about making accessible retail environments, making sure that they're, they're educational and focus, or that's the forward facing brand premise for the products that they feature. So there's definitely many more shifts to come and i think you know we can all probably echo as as shareholders in the companies that we work for is yeah. this is not a short-sighted vision this is a long-term vision i have two young kids this is their college fund right this isn't the tomorrow car fund for the family so i'm looking like 20 years into the future where are we headed and what are we building to build a sustainable foundation that my kids can one day participate in this economy too yeah, makes sense. 20 years makes sense because I know when we first got started, we want to change immediately, but these things do take time. 100%. But do you all believe that, that we are actually gaining momentum at like combating the illicit market and like there's going to be opportunities for PSAs later on down the road? And if anyone wants to take that question, go ahead, because uh, really at the end of the day, when there's limitations, obviously, with marketing branding, it's all word of mouth right now. And if there's actual PSAs, like that's something that makes sense, does it not? Look, I, I, like I said, I think we've been making incremental progress. I think we've started to see a return in some areas, particularly in and around Toronto, uh, of illicit market activity or ramped up illicit market activity. But, you know, the fact that we've gone from, you know, the, like in 2018, the illicit market short, like six months after legalization, it still had about like 75% of total Canadian sales. Now, you know, depending on which stat you look at, it's down to like, you know, maybe a low of like 25% in Saskatchewan and Alberta to let's say, you know, up to like, let's say 40% in Ontario. Yeah. Um, these are ballpark figures, obviously. Uh, so there's obviously more work to do. Uh, and this is where I really think, you know, we can, we can be partners with government, right? So rather yeah. than going to them and complaining all the time and saying, Oh, you should be doing this and you should be doing that. And you should be doing this. Um, 
we have to do our parts, right? What, you know, one of one of the reasons that a lot of governments, particularly provincial governments, are reticent to be seen to be too close to the cannabis industry is because our industry, let's be honest, still has a, a, a large amount of stigma, particularly in East and South Asian communities. Those communities, I'm talking with my lobbyist hat on right now. Sorry, guys, I'm nerding out. Okay. Those communities are concentrated in the greater Toronto and Vancouver areas, right? What are the seats, like federally and provincially, that parties die over? What are those swing seats? They're all in the, the Toronto and, and Vancouver suburbs. Yeah. Right? So our industry has done a very bad job, almost non-existent job, in terms of doing community outreach in, and education into those communities uh, and, and educating them about how, you know, the... Sky what's the first steps that you would do? What, what's the solution? Well, so number one, you have to identify where, where a lot of stigma comes from, right? So on the on the East, East Asian side, it's it's rooted um, to a large extent uh, to the experiences that happened uh, during the opium wars in, in Hong Kong and in China. On the South Asian side, a lot of it is 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 religious based. Um, so you know, one of the things that we do is when like when we were going into Mississauga, for example, we were leading yep. we were leading the lobbying effort for Mississauga to opt into cannabis sales. Right? Took three. Speaking of taking a long time. Took, took three kicks at the can to, to get to get the city council to to, to reverse its position, uh, and, and you know one of the things we we realized was we're not going to be able to necessarily uh, win over some of the older community leaders um, because you know their minds are just made up and and it, you know it, it's it's harder for them to accept it's generational thing. I yeah. see that everywhere. We went to some of the young young younger people, right? So we br we brought uh, we would mobilize. Uh, you know, young black community activists, young South Asian community activists to come to City Hall and make deputations. Um, so you, you have to do that, right? If you're, if you're not present, you're losing the narrative. And unfortunately, this industry has not been present. And, you know, I've been vocal about this in the past. Some of it is to do with the fact that, you know, if you look at the major C-suites in the publicly traded cannabis world, uh, it's not a ton of folks from those communities uh, represented at that level. I think High Tide and a few others are, are, are exceptions to that rule. So we need to be better. We need to be better uh, in terms of making sure that our, our senior teams are representative of, of the communities we are selling to. And we need to be, do, we need to be more proactive. Like the, the government's not going to create a parade of reg, for regulatory change. If you create a parade, they may jump onto that bandwagon. Right? Mm. But they're not gonna. They're not gonna expend the political capital. I hear that everywhere I go. Lift the industry up. The, the industry has to make the case for that. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I see that both in Canada and the U.S. right now. You can't depend on the government. Yeah, there's actual, you know, plans. Um, uh, you have to be in Washington. You have to be in Ottawa. You have to have these conversations. It's speaking to your local constituents to get support and to be in front of these lawmakers to say. This is what's currently going on right now. These are the amount of jobs and economic opportunity that the country presents as far as tax revenue. However, at the same time, there's not enough of that going on right now. Do you agree with that, Michael? Yeah, and you know, really when I look at our industry and kind of where we should be driving to or, or some of the opportunities we do have, like, you know, Omar did a great job covering, let's call it the um, the uh, the Ottawa provincial government and uh, municipal government perspective, but as an industry as well is you know, going back to what Emma was saying, it was a lot of, you know, early cowboy type business, uh, business operators. Yeah. And the biggest thing yeah. we can do as, a, as an industry is build trust. And that's not just trust in our products that people feel safe going to going to a high tide store to pick up a glacial gold product or an MTL product, um, but also trust from an investor and a credit standpoint. And that's one thing where we've lost that trust as an industry in the early days. And we're all building it back up and, and you know you you look at any press release that you know comes out of next leaf or, or high tide or mtl and it's very focused on business fundamentals and that's the one thing we're going be taking a part of uh, getting rid of that stigma is trust in the industry that these are good operators these are good c-suites that know how to run a business properly it's not you know like omar is saying not taking you know private jets everywhere but it's it's running a business like a business and returning that capital to shareholders by doing good products not by yeah. cutting corners, by having integrity, by working together. And that you're going to start to see that. And like I've talked about partnership and, and that's where you start to build the, you know, let's call it the winners in this industry or, that are going to be here, you know, like Emma said, in 20 years, because those are the ones that are going to be dictating that policy that Omar is talking about because they've trusted, they've been there. That's no different than the anheuser Bushes or the, you know, yep. insert company here that has been around for 50 years. They have, they have a seat at the table because they've been trusted to do the right thing. And, and, and really, you know, take care of business for, for a long time. And that's what we're yeah. all trying to do here. 
completely agree. Well, look, I know there's been a lot of opportunities that you guys are, uh, you know, progressing, taking advantage of and performing in Canada. I also want to focus on the international market. And Emma, you know, we look outside of Canada and we look at markets like Europe. We look at markets like Australia. Let's like not get ahead of ourselves when it comes to the U.S. because there's a lot of what could take place. But I've heard that for a long, long time, which I'm sure everybody has. But if you're a Canadian company with international aspirations, like what opportunities need to be addressed to establish, I guess, a strong foothold within those markets? We've been talking about partnerships and that is the number one. You're going into a jurisdiction that is foreign as far as operations, um, political nuance, as an example, cultural nuance as well, consumer preferences. So partnerships are essential, boots on the ground that understand the ecosystem and the regulatory constraints of which you're entering, but also the shifting um, regulatory expectations in terms of what types of certifications are required to export to certain jurisdictions. So we you know, for so long held GMP as the ultimate barometer to make or break an export strategy. And even in the past 18 months, we've been, you know, fully aware that there's alternative pathways to an export strategy that may not be us directly exporting from our facility, but creating those partnerships where our ingredients are being exported to um, jurisdictions overseas. And so that's the current exploration path for us is through partners. It doesn't have to be your own complete value proposition. This can be in concert or in cohort with, with others who complement your skills. So it might be their existing relationships. It might be their distribution partners, um, pathway to market. So it, it really for us is focusing on the minimum viable product, which is our yep. ingredients, our high purity ingredients, and then um, leveraging partnerships to, to make our initial foray international. So what would you say is like the most important lessons based on the rollout here in Canada that could be applied when entering into some of these other markets, like in Europe and in Australia and potentially in the U.S.? I almost want to let Michael chat to this because, you know, we see it so often with cultivation. Why create cultivation overseas? The cultivation can happen here in Canada and the ingredients and the finished product can be exported. But I'll tee that over to you, Michael, as a cultivator. Yeah, and honestly, and I, I echo everything you said, Emma, like it, it really is partnerships. Like even for us, when we started to build our international supply chain, and it really is a supply chain, like there was people along the entire way, like Emma was describing that play a role into it. Like you can't just go and you know, as a single company, just go kick in the door of a country that you, you know, you don't really know much about and expect to win there. It's, it, you really need to rely on good Easier said than done, right? Very much. It, it, you, you gotta, you know, uh, you gotta kiss a lot of frogs to get there. And it takes, it takes some time. And like, you know, I, we were very fortunate that we had relationships that date back, you know, five, six years that we're able to, you know, build the, build that trust with over time. And, you know, it was the right foot at the right time. And, and, and for us, like it's, it's, it's being responsive to the market. Like you find that supply chain, you find those trusted partners, uh, like Emma was talking about. And then, you know, it's no different than in Canada as well. Like you have to listen to the consumer. You have to listen, listen to the medical patient. Uh, yeah. You have to listen to your distributor. Like if it's a pharmacy group in Germany or a pharmacy group in Australia, you have to listen to what they want and what they need and how to bet. You know, the goal is to be the best partner you possibly can. And if you're the best partner you possibly can be to those, to those distributors and to those patients, they're going to keep coming back and and because it's it's a great relationship and you want to make sure that everyone along your supply chain is winning because uh, if you have an inequity along the supply chain it's not going to last that long it's not going to be resilient and so it's it really is partnerships all day long and 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 strengthening those to make sure that everyone's getting uh you know getting a fair piece and 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 is able to grow together i can't imagine how many different scenarios that you have to face you know when you're doing from country to country all the time and who you're working with but is that an understatement you know an under my undervaluing that and like you know really in a lot of ways, Omar, like I assume that you have to, in some ways, be a chameleon when you're different, obviously you said with different countries, but what's the biggest thing that I guess you've learned, I guess, when dealing in the international markets in comparison in Canada? So one, um, you got to find a way to filter out the hype. Um, so, you, you know, you, you got to do your own work. You got to do your own research. You got to do your own homework. You got to look at the size of the market. Um, you then, you know, based on what you're trying to achieve and, and, and the metrics in that market, then you, you got to prioritize, right? You can't be everywhere uh, all the time and you should put your own boots on the ground. Uh, so I'll use Germany for an example, right? We talked about something that takes a long time to happen, right? So Germany has been, trained, Germany has been working on adult use reform now for, for, for over three years, right? Long time. Since, since the current government, went, well, since the, the traffic light coalition was, was, was elected, uh, uh um, four years ago, excuse me. Um, uh, and, you know, you have to be able to understand 
all the risks, all the potential risks and potential changes and pivots that might come your way, right? So, for example, the you know the the coalition government in Germany collapsed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of the, one of the one of the main coalition partners withdrew. Um, you know that that's probably going to mean that they will that their that their their government will be dissolved before January, and that they will be in an election in February uh, by the end of February. Which, if you look at the opinion polls right now, the the center right, the Christian Democrats are probably going to win, and they're fairly against. <laughs> they've been fairly vocal in their opposition to adult use uh, reforms, right? Mm. But you know, Germany is a country of eighty six million people, more than double the size of Canada. Consumption rates are a bit are a bit less. Um, so there's many there's many ways to crack that nut, right? Um, so you know, without getting into you know corporate strategy or anything, I'm just going to say. People should just be patient. People should be calm. People should watch what happens politically, uh, monitor it, get educated on it, uh, you know, and, and and make the appropriate investments. Right? You can't you can't run a strategy for a country like Germany or the Netherlands or others from sitting in Toronto or from sitting in Calgary. You no. need people there who are knowledgeable, who understand the market, who understand the regulatory, the political dynamics, who can give you honest feedback. And lastly, just reiterate again: filter out the hype. Filter out the hype. Do your own homework. Tough to do for many in this space, but it's common sense. But yeah, you're right. It's just, you know, I think at the end of the day, regulation, uh, not easy. It's an industry. It's a career. It's a profession that we're in right now. And uh, I think that's putting it mildly as far as getting from point A to point B. It's an understatement. But, you know, the key thing here, and I wanted people to really understand, and I think you guys would all agree, is, is that the consumer traffic and foot traffic across the country, you know, here in Canada is growing and the industry is evolving. And yes, there has been consolidation. However, it's still a thriving industry. Saying that, if we look at south of the border in the U.S. and we see some sort of reform, Emma, like how are you positioning or preparing yourself in the event, you know, this does indeed happen? Like, does that create all kinds of opportunities from an importing and exporting uh, position for you? Yeah, for us, the beauty is for sure we could export um, extracts all day long, but also our technology could be licensed in the U.S. So, you know, we were speaking before we jumped live on the call about the farm bill. So even hemp extractors, as an example, could be using our technology to process high purity ingredients from less desirable crops or, you know, things that didn't meet spec or outdoor grown, as an example. So licensing technology is, is definitely an opportunity for us as regulations shift in the U.S., exporting our ingredients and then hopefully making a, a foray with Glacial Gold in the future but that to us honestly is tertiary we've talked about mvp before and so it's keeping it as close to our intellectual property and our personal value proposition as a company which is our technology our extraction technology so yeah. licensing opportunities or ingredient export so along with mtl and the industry as a whole here in canada in the u.s if there is some sort of reform michael how do you see that basically helping the canadian market well, first off, with the Canadian market, like you said, it, it's it's still growing at, at rapid pace. And that's the one thing, like in Canada, we are the highest regulated and most competitive market in the world that's federally legal. And the nice thing with the folks that are, are the, the, the LPs that are performing in Canada and starting to export around the world is if there is ever a federal regulatory regime in the US where let's say the FDA does anything that's a mimic of the Canadian the Canadian regulatory space for uh, for uh, federal cannabis um, that's going to be really challenging for a lot of operators and if you're going to lift and land like Emma was saying IP or processes SOPs technology just how to operate in a in a competitive regulatory network there's no better group of companies in the world than the than the top performers in Canada to lift and land that and go and perform and compete in the US because like I said we're already doing it in the most competitive market in the world and when that market opens up and if there's a you know a, a bar that's close to what Canada is the Canadian operators are going to be best in best in class to go down and compete and that's that's something I think all of us are very much looking forward to in the for, in the future yeah you agree with that Omar yeah, you know, I'll, I'll speak from a from a self interested perspective. <laughs> so we we would obviously love to be plant touching in the U.S. Right? What is what is currently holding us back from that is Nasdaq and the TSX prohibitions on listing U U.S. plant touching businesses. Right, and that's because of the proceeds of Crime Act. Um, so the trigger that would, would that we believe would lead to them changing their policies. Uh, could be a capital markets, uh, some, some capital market safe harbor language inserted into the Safe Banking Act or the Safe Air Banking Act, uh, which uh, a number of the MSOs and their lobbyists in Washington are, are working on 
with some Democrats. Remains to be seen if that actually happens. Uh, or number two, uh, a federal descheduling event. So delisting, not schedule three, but total delisting, which the, uh, you know, the, the current nominees for health and human services secretary and attorney general in the U.S. are on record as supporting. Favorable. They're on their yeah. both on record as supporting. So let's see if that plays out. Um, or legislated um, legalization, which both of those people I just mentioned are also, I believe, on favor, in, uh, publicly in favor of, at least in the past, have been in favor of. Uh, but, you know, the the beauty with High Tide is that while we're ready for U.S. legalization or a move that would allow us to be plant touching in the U.S., our business strategy doesn't depend on it. Uh, you know, we already have quite a, you know, we are, you know our, our U.S. customer database I apologize, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it's 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 like over it's like in the millions, right? right. And that's based that's essentially all, not, that's entirely based on our e-commerce platforms related to consumption accessories and and hemp drive CBD, uh, which is a similar approach we took in Canada, right? So if you know Raj's story, that you know he started Smokers Corner selling accessories uh, in Calgary, grew that into a province-wide chain, converted that into cannabis stores when legalization happened. So we feel we're really well set up in the U.S. to do that uh, yep. because we have that existing customer base from our e-commerce platforms uh, that could rev- readily be transitioned into into brick and mortar sales uh, if and when the time is right. You believe that, though, with the amount of like you're going to have a lot of competition that's already well established in these markets, though, like that yeah, sounds. The U.S. Cool. is a big it's a big, it's a big country. Right. So obviously we, one of the things we, we we have the benefit of is is kind of seeing what works and what, what what's worked and what hasn't worked. Um, and you know, we don't need to go where everybody else already is. Right. Uh, yeah. Like I said, we're, 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 people are complaining about a certain amount of saturation in, in Canada. We're still growing our store count and we're still doing so profitably. Right. So, yeah. so we can take that same strategy to the U S we're fairly confident about that. Well, yeah, big but, thing but is- our strategy doesn't depend on it is my, is my, is my point. <laughs> yes. Well, it goes to show, like I said before, it's just like focus on obviously what's working now, but if I had to leave all three with one word to best describe the Canadian, Can- Canadian cannabis landscape, Emma, what would that one word be? Resilient. Resilient. Michael? Uh, competitive. Competitive. Omar, how about you? Maturing. Maturing. Uh, you know, a lot, well some, of the, some of the early, some of the early, you know, Riff Raff is now no longer in the industry uh, and more adults have come in, which is a good thing. Yeah. Listen, appreciate it. I hope everybody got some great feedback and just the current landscape of what it looks like, but most importantly, what it's going to be doing moving forward, heading into 2025. But Emma, Michael, Omar, appreciate you checking in here today, giving us, we should do this more of this. I like this panel sure. approach. And uh, really, uh, rising tide rises all ships, right? So listen, keep in touch. A lot of respect for these guys, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, this is great. Likewise. Thanks again. Let's keep in touch, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching our latest podcast. What'd you all think? Is there any information that we're missing? Is there anything you want us to cover? As these industries heat up, we're getting access to more and more big hosts. So let us know the questions that you want us to ask for you. As usual, smash that like button. We want this to go viral. Click on that bell for all notifications for the latest interviews that we're doing. And as usual, let's build this community. Subscribe to our channel because we appreciate it. Because we wouldn't be here without you. Thanks for watching, everyone.